natural quanto a luz do dia Mas que preguiça boa me deixa aqui à toa Hoje ninguém vai estragar meu dia Só vou gastar energia pra beijar sua boca Fica comigo então is kind of a collaboration which probably introduce that right off the bat yeah um, yeah clint cronin show i'm clint cronin i'm here with roy dean so this is kind of a collaborative thing we're going to launch this across both channels so uh subscribers of the roy dean show uh and the clint cronin show um converge as we uh embark on this uh desert springs podcast journey this morning um happy fourth of july man yeah man happy independence day that's that's what it is uh, we're well and happy canada day i know there's plenty of canadian jujiteros up there so that's three days away right three days off uh-huh i think july 1st is canada day right i don't remember although i should since i used to live there yeah I, th i think it's the first of july so it's it's been a long weekend drove down on saturday no sunday morning for a new japan pro wrestling g1 uh u.s special in long beach so what'd you think of that it's so cool to see the uh the level of theatrics and the work that goes into it and I mean, I know, I know a lot of people, a lot of the purists, the grapplers, the, the, the fight fans, all that. They're going to say, well, it's fake. But a lot of, uh, there's a lot of Game of Thrones fans on here. I'm sure there's a lot of Vikings fans, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of not real either, but it's, it's entertaining as hell. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of work that goes into it. So to me, that's pro wrestling. It's, it's athletic theater. It does hurt. Like I'm, athletic theater. That's good. I, um, in, in terms of like an improv where it hurts real bad. And I've went, I went, I went through the training I've wrestled. Mm -hmm. It, it hurts more than jujitsu if that's possible. It, yeah. Cause you're just falling repeatedly over and over on a surface. That's not really designed for that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, it's something I have a lot of appreciation for. I was a fan as a kid, just like a lot of like martial arts fans, right. Yeah. Then we wind up into it except, uh, you know, Pro wrestling hurts a lot worse, I think. Well, yeah, especially when you're adrenalized and you got like the crowd and you're in the moment and you want to deliver, you're a showman. And I, I can just imagine that some things don't hurt in the moment. Oh, for sure. You don't realize it until you're done. And then they have a chiropractor backstage. If you're, if you work for a good promotion, they usually have somebody that'll adjust you and stuff. Yeah. I was very fortunate where we had that, where it was absolutely needed. They, they made sure your hips were where they were supposed to go and that things were in alignment. Oh. This, this is years and years back, but, um, I, I certainly couldn't slash wouldn't do it now. Um, I just too much wear and tear on the body. <sighs> Time and place, my man. Set and setting. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, 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 it's strange. Uh, the, uh, the Japanese wrestling, it feels, it seems like the fans and very, very, have very strict, like, or, you know, very parallel, uh, sort of a setup to the MMA fans, the, the martial arts fans, the, the sumo fans in Japan, where they, they seem to have more of a reverence and more of a respect for the art as opposed to in the U S there's a lot more booing and chanting, and this is the boring chants and stuff for MMA. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like in Japan, there, it has like a special place where it, it really is uh, more revered, more respected down there. So, yeah, I think we could, uh, we could do with a little bit more of that, a little bit more of the reverence, a little bit more of the technical appreciation, not just appreciating the submission, but understand having enough understanding to be able to under to appreciate the setup for the submission. Um, or the beautiful movement that allows you to move into the submission. Oh, absolutely. It's, I used to have, a almost a complex about, I was, I was always a little bit larger than my training partners mm -hmm. at my gym, which is like, it's pretty common once you're in, into the heavyweight and super heavyweight division, there aren't as many grapplers that stick around. It's like right. retention in jujitsu is anyway, not that great. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I would, I would get, I would be almost, uh, sort of very self-deprecating about uh, my, my size in that I, I felt like anytime I would achieve a submission or a better position or a sweep, I would have the commentary from my, my training partner, my opponent, man, you're so strong. And hmm. it used to, I, I used to have a chip on my shoulder about it. Like, man, you don't, you don't even, I had you 10 moves ago. You don't, right. You don't, right. Yeah. The, the, the intricate, the intricate details of getting from point A to point B, like you were going really hard and from getting to that position was actually a lot of work. And, 
So I almost wanted and strive to be a much better bottom, like guard player, mm. just because I wanted to have that side of it. Even then, I would be yeah. at, at the bottom of mount deliberately so a lot of times. Because you want to be known for your technique. You want to be good. You want to be really technical. Yes. And, and to not have that backhanded compliment thrown at you like, dude, you're so strong. That's amazing. It, yeah. You know? And I, I, re I recognize now that it shouldn't matter and that, you know, self auditing is, you know, it's something everyone does. They look at their accomplishments or failures and, uh, you know, they'll see someone else that, uh, I'm, they're going to try doing A, B, or C and they see in themselves like, wow, that's scary. I don't think I could do that. So they'll probably fail too. They, I hope they fail, you know, mm. that kind of thing. Like it's very toxic thinking, but it's very common, right? A lot of it is common, but you know, the more people that can say there's plenty of room for success in the world. You know, success is the natural way. Let's, sure. let's, you know, support that. But yeah, there, I mean, there is kind of a toxicity to the, um, you know, not rooting for others to win. But, we, you know, I think, I think jujitsu is one of the vehicles that allows you to, to flip that where you, over time, it may not be obvious at first, but you can really see that the success of your training partners helps you. The, the the team building right we were talking about it a little bit earlier on you know growing the gym and how it's you know important to work with the the, the lower belts to make sure they stick around they stay you know and for the for the sake of the family and that if you know if my training partners get better then they're going to push me i'm going to become better I, from my experience in jujitsu, that's that's a thing that i found in most of the the, the healthier academies that i right. that i've visited or i've been a part of um, your martial arts background is very storied. It, it goes back years and years and years to, J to Japan, essentially. Uh -huh. In in dealing with uh, judo and aikido, is is that sense of uh, building the the younger guys? Is that is that a thing there, or is it more cutthroat? Absolutely, a uh, senpai kohai. Okay, you know, senpai is the senior student, kohai is uh, the younger student, and that's a really important dynamic in in uh, Japan. Sometimes that can be abused a little bit and there is an, an element of cruelty in japanese budo which is not talked about that often but overall the the kohai uh give enormous respect to the senpai and the senpai then take care of it. it's their responsibility because they're getting this respect to to kind of nurture um and grow that next generation so i mean it definitely works both ways and they'd be frowned upon if they were to um not like personally invest in bringing up the their kohai. I know in uh, in sumo and in pro wrestling they have like the concept of young boys, right? So oh, yeah, coming up through the dojo and having to clean up after everyone and yeah. you know bring rice to the the the, the sumo fighter for sure, carry bags for the wrestlers and stuff. So uh, in that in that traditional aspect, apprenticeship, yes, yes. Um, I, I've, I've heard uh, firsthand accounts of at least the pro wrestling side of guys going over there and getting, you know, getting their feet wet in Japan mm -hmm. and coming out extremely versatile and extremely skilled as compared to some of the guys that are learning in the States, uh, just because of the, the wide array of people from all over the world that go over there and the dojo culture of you really have to work. You have to, you know, pay your dues, earn the respect and, uh, to even break in is, is very difficult. I, I imagine yeah. sumo, it's way more, uh, uh, you know, you know, stringent or way more difficult. Um, just, yeah, sumo is a, is a really beautiful subset of Japanese Budo. And some people would say it's like the original Budo that that's where jujitsu came from in some ways. I mean, what's the, the you learn techniques to off balance somebody. And now we have all these, really sophisticated uh, submission chains. You off balance somebody, they're forced to react. They react in the way that you wanted them to, which creates an opening for you. You know, the whole idea of using Kazushi as an attack, not just the threat of a submission. So I, I think that's, it's really, it's really an amazing uh, historical and cultured sport that they have a lot of, I like that the Japanese aren't leaving that behind. In fact, they put more money, they put more energy into preserving the tradition. And there's nothing like, I haven't seen sumo live, but I would love to. Oh, for sure. It's uh, the, the J a Japan trip, a proper Japan trip, not just like a work thing, but to actually go over and really uh, have some immersion, spend you know a month or so there and yeah. uh, to go train and uh, to, to go and actually 
take judo seriously and as opposed to I've, I've done judo club and I've done some judo classes in college and, and judo and jujitsu schools and stuff like sure. that. And I have an appreciation for the throws and the technique and the nawaza, the things that I've learned that way, but it's been very piecemeal, but to actually go to Japan to where it, it's you're immersed. Yes. And uh, just, just really jump in there and just to, to see what's what. And uh, cause I know it's work. I'm, I'm not afraid of work. I'm not shy of work. I just, I'd like to be there to see what it's like on, you know, ground zero, where everything really grew, uh, at mm -hmm. least in that, uh, you know, leg of, uh, the martial arts that, uh, that I've, you know, taken up over the last, you know, decade and a half or whatever. Mm -hmm. I've been in some sort of martial art or fighting thing, <laughs> like probably since I'm like this tall. Right. But, but uh, to really jump in and, uh, be there where it really started or where it splintered off. Right. It's a spiritual home base for martial arts, definitely. You know, and, and people can say that it came from China or it came from India or what it, whatever that was. But sure. there was definitely a unique flowering that occurred with the isolation of, of Japan and um, the samurai traditions. And uh, although a lot of people now reference um, samurai culture, especially with Aikido and some of these. Other, I mean, I really feel like we're, we're way past samurai culture and a lot of those techniques that they used is is maybe in the more fantasy realm you know when people kind of use that as a a crutch well you know we never go to the ground because on the battlefield if you're on the ground you know but that but ultimately losing your weapon being on the ground and having to you know fight for your survival with armor on was the I mean, it's far now, but it was the genesis of a lot of these uh, unarmed techniques that we, we use. Well, I, I mean, you can even go back to some of the, the traditional martial arts that take uh, a lot of the exotic kicks and think back, well, we're not disarming anyone, dismounting anyone from a horse forcibly. Right. Um, so maybe those flying kicks aren't that practical now. But then again, you see Leota Mashida take uh, you know, his, his karate and... He, he has kicks that are that would have previously have been frowned upon in mixed martial arts or in combat sports, and he's used them pretty effectively. So, uh, like before, like set and setting, right? Yes. Um, yes. Pe people like to frown upon Aikido because of whatever, the, mm -hmm. but get wrist locked and then tell me that there aren't some valid techniques there. No and, doubt, yeah. no doubt, and, and people are rediscovering these, you know these uh sometimes more exotic techniques that were frowned upon at one time because yeah if you you know you might be able to lose your balance easily if you're on one leg and you you know you don't know how to sprawl you don't know how to set up that kick so you have the window of opportunity to to go into it but i mean as far as high kicks um who was it that went off the fence it was the kick that went off the fence Oh, that's right. That was, uh, and that was, that was a moment. That was a moment. Uh, what was his name? Prime Showtime. Uh, per, was it Pettis? Pettis. Anthony was it, Pettis. Was it, was it yeah. The Showtime kick off the fence. Mm -hmm. And that he, he did a wall walk basically. And you know, it was what a fly, a jumping sidekick or something like that. Or a yeah. Yeah. Run, bam, use that energy off the fence. I mean, th those things, that's genius right there. When you're using those elements to your advantage unexpectedly, and skillfully it would be like us watching uh that break into remember the electric boogaloo movie from like 30 years dude ago? i was, was raised on that stuff yeah that sure. would be like watching that then and saying well that's a bunch of bullshit and then going and seeing these like the 10th planet guys now using break dancing at, as a part of the extension of their jujitsu you know their dexterity their flexibility i, I roll with boogeyman and whatever he came from isn't bullshit at all. That's a tough dude. Oh yeah. That's a real, like, so their flexibility and you see some of the submissions that they put on that for me would be impossible. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. just, I don't have that dexterity because I, I haven't trained it. Obviously I'm not a break dancer, but, uh, there's some really exotic submissions, leg locks and all this stuff, but and it was just break dancing, right? It was just break dancing, but the things that he was able to take from that and bring it over, and it's not even a martial art. So to say that there aren't valid uh, aspects of any martial art, there are, there clearly are. And, but it's set and setting and taking those pieces from those arts and applying them, uh, you know, in a functional way. Totally. And, and, but that makes me wonder, like, is it a martial art? It, I think in a way, break dancing might be a little bit of a martial art because they would have like the battles, right? And it's for it's for even though it's kind of a non-contact martial art, it's almost like urban capoeira. See, that would be cool. They could blend the two and make like a break capoeira. 
Oh, I, that would be cool. That would be cool. I would watch that. I'd totally watch that. <laughs> I, I have a, I've liked a few breakdancing things. So there's a, I get some things in my Facebook feed from stance and the level of coordination and the way these guys can ride the momentum so beautifully. Um, the momentum that they generate with their body and these spins and the, and the way they freaking catch themselves on their head. And dude, it's so badass. The, the break dancing these days is so badass. I just, I, I marvel at it. And, uh, you know, I can move, but I can't move like that. No, exactly. I, I've got a friend that does the parkour stuff. But mm. He was a break dancer before. He was a wrestler before. He did MMA in uh, at least amateurs, and he's a brown belt in jujitsu. He's this little dude. Yeah. Um, this guy, uh, Shy, is ball of muscle on Instagram. But his vid <laughs> his videos, it's it's a little Persian dude, but he he looks like an Avenger. Like the stuff that they they use stunt men for. Yeah. He he literally flies. Like the the stuff he attempts and pulls off, actually, like you see a lot of these guys eating, you know, eating it pretty good. Yeah, the stuff he's able to do, like he he did, he does the just joking around. We had one of our guys stand there, and he he did the Pettis wall walk, but he ran like three steps up the wall and did a flying triangle on a dude. Just, what? Just just because he could do it, yeah. Because that's how sick this guy was with these the, the with the break dancing and all these different skills combined. And I'm like, well, this is just a dude I know from my gym. I mean, yeah. there, like there's some fantastic athletes out there. Like we probably haven't even seen. And once they get, uh, you know, one of them's going to get creative and start ad adapting the stuff and just going to run around that octagon, like uh, Tony Hawk on a half pipe or something. Yeah, it is. It is amazing. The level of athlete that um, BJJ and MMA is starting to, you know, gain traction with. Um, I think it's, I think it's pretty incredible. Uh, every time I go through an airport and run across, like a competitive basketball player or a college football player. I'm like, dude, are we even the same species? Like it's crazy, right? I'm not a small, I'm six, two. I'm not a small dude, but these guys are like, they're huge. They are huge. Yeah. And, um, no, we're, we're moving into another era and, and, you know, all the different cross training, you know, really the king of all athletics is gymnastics. And yes. then, and then to be able to enroll your kid in gymnastics and then enroll them in Taekwondo and then enroll in, in Jiu Jitsu. And I mean, that kind of like early developmental education for physical literacy is we're, we're creating a whole nother level of, of athlete. And it's, it's, it's really cool. Looking back at some of the things that I got, you know, roped into doing as a kid, like oh, the, because the athletics for a lot of parents are that's a babysitter, right? So they're like, yeah. they're like, you're going here, you're going here, you're going here. The summer here, maybe after school over here. If you're if you're lucky enough to have parents that are, you know, do pushing sure. pushing stuff because a lot don't, a lot don't, a lot just do whatever, and you know they they wind up lost. There's probably so many freak athletes that just don't get stuck into these things. But uh, if if I went back and I had to kind of knowing what I know now. I wish I would have done gymnastics for sure. Uh, wrestling more seriously, mm -hmm. uh, way more seriously. And uh, the one thing that I did uh, actually wind up doing that helped me a lot in martial arts and other sports. Um, I, when I was playing basketball, my dad's like, you gotta, you need dance lessons. Like you should. And, and he was, I thought he was like joking. Like I should go to ballet. I, I never actually wound up going to ballet, but sure. I did go to like, I, I got salsa ballroom lessons, like for about yeah. two years. And that helped hip dexterity balance. Like, you ever you ever have a friend that they maybe they even weigh like a hundred pounds, but if they were to try to like tiptoe to like get a cookie out of a cookie jar by step two, their parents would bust them. Like they just walk very sure, heavy footed, yeah, yeah. or they trip a lot. You ever have this, the the one student in class where you're like, dude, this guy's just he just he needs to learn how to move his weight better. That mm. stuff. Um, I've, early on, I think a lot of basketball players uh, that were successful did that. Uh, they did mm. the dance lesson. They learned how to you know move their weight better and. For me, it helped with coordination, with balance a lot. And it's uh, for single guys out there, you should learn salsa dancing. It's magic. It works. It for <laughs> sure works. It's, it's, it's one more thing. You, like, you should have that skill set. Mm -hmm. You don't brag mm -hmm. about having it. Yeah. But, but having it's good. No, it like, pays I mean, dividends. Hey, hey what, what, are you going to go get married? You don't know how to dance? You're supposed to have the first dance. Everybody's looking. You're too, you, know, you don't want two left feet. Mm -hmm. So it, it, And for, for athletics... Definitely the, the having that the coordination and you'd get that from gymnastics for sure. 
but gymnastics and wrestling, like the dexterity plus the strength and the, the, the work ethic. Yeah. The work ethic in wrestling is really impressive. When I was a brown belt, I went to a, uh, a wrestling camp because my wrestling sucked. I was a brown belt. My wrestling sucked. I knew it. I need to, I yep. need to improve before I become a black belt. I need to fill that hole. And, uh, so Mark Munoz was, uh, but this was way before he went to the UFC. He was, he was running it and Uriah Faber was his assistant because he was Uriah's coach. Yep. Um, and dude, it really impressed me with the, the work ethic, man. Quitters never win. Winners never quit. You know, basically don't be a pussy. Grind it out. I mean, it was all about yourself. It was all about self-motivation. It was all about, and it, it was in stark contrast to some other organizations and other activities I had been in where it was more about, I mean, you can offload that responsibility to other people, but in wrestling, it's all on you, man. Oh, it's yeah. all on you. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, it just having the, uh, the, the, the ter determination to stick with the practices just early, like you're running miles and sprints and stuff, just even as little kids, they get in there, but from the beginning of a wrestling season, you know, the practices, everything competition to the end of it, uh, you see how just the kids are night and day different. Um, you ask the parents like, what were your kids like before and after wrestling? And uh, most of the parents are like, dude, night and day. They, they used to, you know, act out there. They misbehave all the time because it, it sounds crappy, but like, uh, you know, when people wind up having dogs that kind of, they wind up getting aggressive, but like, it's usually the ones who just sit around the apartment all day. They're less like, just, they're ignored. Pent up energy. Too much energy. You got to burn that off. And like, you get these kids out there, especially in jujitsu too, same thing. The kids that come in, like a lot of them misbehave. The parents are like, I don't know what to do with them. His grades suck, but they go through a jujitsu program that has like, a good kids program. And it's just night and day difference. And the same with wrestling. It's just like, it builds so many good character traits. And I guess it's down to culture. Like it could go wrong if it's just like a bad instructor or something. But most kids that I've seen go into wrestling now as an adult looking like backwards. I'm like, yeah, uh, when I have kids at some point, if I do that, I want them for sure to be into wrestling. I'll have to like whatever reverse psychology to get them in there. Cause I, I for sure wish yeah. I would have went crib like, with a mat and I, yeah, crib with a mat. Exactly. Just like, no, you know, there'll be a resilient to staph infection from the womb. Just like, oh, that's good. I like, I like where you're going with this. <laughs> it's like, we'll just condition them. We'll just, we'll, <laughs> it'll be some crazy shit, but um, I'm sorry. You can beat me out on, I, I tend to not curse too much on my own channel, but sometimes I do. And I just don't edit it. So it, it's all good. It's all good. And so the, the one cool thing I, I never knew much about this, but you were a foreign exchange student as a kid, like at 16 in yeah. Japan. Mm -hmm. How did that, I mean, is that something you wanted to do? Is it something your parents just sort of dropped on you? How did that work out? Like, Oh, well, there's kind of an interesting story. Um, me going to Japan originated with me being kind of discontent in Alaska. I had, I just felt like I needed to see more of the world. Cool. So I went to, I went to my mom and I said, you know, I, I think I want to, see more of the world she said look into an exchange program so after we went to i went to the counselor the next day and she's like oh well you must have seen the signs and apparently maybe subconsciously i had seen these rotary exchange student signs all right and it was very it was past the deadline but she made a call and someone had just canceled their interview so i went that night for an interview and they looked at my grades and they kind of made a decision. They asked where I wanted to go and I wanted to go, I wanted to go to Sweden. I wanted to go to Sweden. Sweden's cool. And then second choice was any other country in the world. Third choice, any other country in the world. So I didn't get Sweden. I didn't find this out until about six months later when they had selected me to go to Japan and Japan. I was like that. Was, Japan is not Sweden. No, it's a wrong hair color. Yeah. It looks a little different. Uh, so it looks a little different. It, but man, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. You know, you don't try to control so much and the universe delivers something really amazing. I, I just say yes to stuff. I feel like life has been so much better since I just decided to stop saying no to stuff. Is that, mm. is that weird? I just say yes to everything and it just sort of works out really awesome. <laughs> well, it's very, being open to new experiences is uh, pretty tremendous. And you know, when you travel a lot, you have to, to do that you can't micromanage everything from your original idea wherever you planned that trip from 
that house or apartment that you planned it from is not, you just don't have the view on, on what is a good idea to do it. So you got to be flexible in the moment. And I think jujitsu helps with that. It just adds fluidity because whatever your expectations are going into any jujitsu, anything, just jujitsu in general, it doesn't matter if it's competition, the real world, the mat, dealing with anything, you have to be very fluid. Um, and that there's so many moving parts and the number of moving parts seems to increase as we go on with life and as the sport and or the art uh, progresses, right? It's like there's more parts than there were. Um, yeah, but those machines, the more parts there are, the more delicate they become and the more chance they could break down at any. So it's like you build the complex machine, you have the option of the complex machine, but then eliminating it down to just the key components that work best for you. So you have the lightest, strongest, highest percentage machine or computer code that you can put into action. It, it's funny. We, we make things like we make these systems of uh, control or whatever control or just, uh, just understanding or attacking problems that may or may not be there. We make them unnecessarily complex a lot. But being able, having the foresight just to zoom out, get a 10,000 foot view and look at what everyone's mm. doing and be like, why? And a lot of times the answer is in just like, oh, why are we doing any of this? Okay. Well, this, that seems like unnecessary movement. Maybe it's just this. The, what, what is the objective? Like, what is the input and what is the desired output? Yeah. yeah. And from there, if it's some. That macro, micro is a really valuable, but you know, people get stuck. And it helps to have a good friend or a mentor to like pull you back. Yeah. And, and get that, get that wide view. I, I had, there had been a number of times where I had been uh, working on specific passes and, uh, and I got pretty good at them, but, mm -hmm. uh, but it took a lot of drilling and a lot of, uh, a lot of very specific situational stuff like and uh I, i've had times where I'd, I'd go over and visit uh cold uh, chris cold iron yeah uh, when, when like leo vieira like leandro would be over there mm -hmm. and i'd be working a pass with chris chris is a tough guy uh, yeah. i'm a little bigger but he's he's very technically he's training with the best of the best and uh <laughs> I'd, I'd go for a pass and i'd get a one out of every couple times but then he'd be like dude why are you doing that like look at your body type look at my body type like why would you go right down the middle that doesn't make any sense you should be going out and yeah. around like <laughs> yeah maybe maybe i mean and you know and the, and that is an interesting conundrum that a lot of jiu-jitsu players find themselves in they admire the way somebody moves they like their game I want to move like that, yet it doesn't necessarily correspond to um, reality. You know, I, we all want to do flying with plata, uh, although I don't do any flying stuff anymore. You know, I mean, all that stuff, you like that, that, that guy's on a tear. Everyone wanted to do, you know, X choke from Mount when Hodger was killing it. Baron, you know, every, Baron, Baron, Baron Bolo, Bolo. Baron everyone Alpha. wants to, everyone wants to do what the top guys are doing. And that's, that's cool, but it doesn't always match to your game. And that was a specialized technique that they perfected that uniquely suits their body type, their disposition, and the rest of their game well. And they're probably about three-fifths our size. Those two. Well, not Hodge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hodge yeah, 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 yeah. He doesn't count. <laughs> Hodge is a special case. Uh, very cool guy, but he's, he's a big dude that moves really well. Him and Bouchesha, for their size, uh, man, they move so well. Yes, um, indeed. But yeah, I think all of us on the mat at some point have like severe body dysmorphia. Like we were talking about the other day, like none of us know how big or small or like how we're shaped on the mat because mm -hmm. we're all kind of like crunched up in a ball all the damn time somehow or another. Totally. So, I mean, yeah, it, when you see the Mendez brothers, when you're on the mat, like you're a Mendez brother. And like, like when you see Hodger, like you're, you're that size. Yeah. <laughs> you don't really realize like you, you don't really self or accurately self, uh, you know, audit i suppose mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's a it's, it's a funny thing but yeah the wrestling's a big deal for jujitsu I, like I, I noticed a lot of uh jujitsu guys every shot they take so when they do shoot because that's what you clearly do that's the only the only to jujitsu people the only wrestling move is a shot like a double leg or a single leg shot and most yeah. of them they they wind up about mm, 15 to 18 inches shy of their target because yeah. they look at the floor when they do it mm -hmm. and I, I feel like not having that uh, head first, uh, impact, like not being, not being hit in the face or not having the, uh, the conditioning of that repeatedly, like getting smashed, like right here. Yeah. 
I, I feel like that does the, a lot of the jujitsu people a lot of you know big disservice. So I, I almost feel like getting punched in the face should be a prerequisite. Like just take a boxing class, learn how to take a hit, and then take a wrestling class, learn how to actually not look at the floor when you shoot for this. Because the majority of failed shots from jujitsu guys, they're looking at the floor and they they, they wind up shallow, and they they get sprawled and sprawled. That that is that is. Um certainly the case and you know before when i would try to do wrestling i didn't have very good setups yeah my, my setups were, were just were not good so as i you know as i traveled around the world and and continue to see like high level wrestlers or here over at cv bjj um the wrestling is fantastic and and wrestling went from closing the distance and shooting in and with me like only occasionally being successful with that i was more successful with my judo because I, I was already in right but like shooting from way out and the guy sprawls and it just it wasn't working for me so i was like my wrestling sucks but i realized that it's so much more about instead of connecting with the body with a big impact it's more about scraping around their body it's much more about using your elbow to lift and open that pocket so you can just scrape around their body and like tracing their body. The really good wrestlers, they, they don't even try to move you that much. They just trace around just like really good jujitsu. Yeah. And there's something great. I, I wish American wrestling did a little bit more. I have to say, even though I'm not that well-versed in all of wrestling culture, I believe that we emphasize conditioning too much and being able to intimidate people through force and uh, whereas i think it, it could be practiced in a more technical way and wrestling might be able to steal a little bit from jujitsu in that sense yeah i you, obviously there's more athleticism in wrestling and just watch nogi right the, yeah, guy, totally. the guys that, that come over to do the naga competitions or whatever uh the, or any of the big yeah. nogi the adcc stuff the, yeah. the wrestlers that come into it um they have a big advantage because they can scare the shit out of jujitsu people they, because if you have a guy that mostly works gi or even no gi, but doesn't do that much from their feet, and then you have a wrestler that comes in there, and they can just bully their way through most stuff. Mm -hmm. And the, a lot of the jujitsu guys will wilt like at that confrontation because it's not like what they're doing on the mat. It's not like the submission game where we're using distraction, we're using misdirection, we're using space management and angles. If they're just going to come and bulldoze you and you get hit that hard, you hit the mat that hard, it's like what they say, like a black. It's psychologically intimidating. Yeah. Like you're like, oh, I, I haven't felt that kind of power before. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, they, they wilt that because that pressure can be substantial and because they do it all the time in wrestling. Yeah. And the guys that learn a couple submissions and come over and they wind up getting going being pretty successful in competition and they matriculate through the belt system because a lot of instructors like having a lot of medals and a lot of wins and a purple belt win looks better than a blue belt win, as does a brown belt with a purple belt so you see people climbing the ranks very rapidly with the wrestling background mm. because they're successful at tournaments but are they doing jujitsu arguable right it, it's debatable and what I, I tend to think that wrestling is a form of jujitsu now. I think it's a form of compressed jujitsu. They compress the sure. time format. They compress the objective. So you have a really specific singular objective, um, you know, pinning with the option of points along the way, as opposed to submission, which can happen in, in many, many, many ways. So I, I do like, I'm a, a fan of wrestling. As I've gotten sure. older, I've, I've turned into more and more of a fan of, of, of wrestling and the simplicity in some ways of a double or single as opposed to a judo throw. I mean, you can, you can pick up on it faster if you have good instruction to do a, a good double or single as opposed to like a seonagi or a, sh a shoulder throw. It, those things take time. I mean, has there been any substantial jujitsu tournament or because it's all kind of the same thing. We're all grappling. We just have different rules and you know variables yeah. that we insert here and there Absolutely. For, for the sake of whatever uh, in jujitsu, the idea, in, especially the way the IBJJF describes it is the, the progression of the fight is basically how everything should be based on progress. That's how penalties and points and advantages increase are. dominance. Yes. Um, but what if we had a pin in our jujitsu competitions as in, like say a five count or even a three count, whatever, or a 30 count, like they do in judo, like Osai Komi, you're like holding the guy in scarf hold or just something, something like that. Because if you're, if you're stuck there that long, I promise you you're losing. 
you're, you're losing for sure. You might not be dead because right. they, they can't kill you in a jujitsu tournament. So that's not exactly accurate, right? Mm-hmm. But if, if they can hold you there to three to five seconds, that's enough to get a good strike off where that head, that the fist or the elbow or whatever, the palm, the palm yeah. very, you know, dangerous uh, implement as well. Once that hits someone in the chin and the back of their head hits the floor, I mean, what else do you want? Like that could be yeah. death, right? It, it could be on the flip side. I, you know, Henner, I, I'm sorry, um, Huron Gracie, I've had the opportunity to, to work with him a little bit and very impressive. I haven't met Henner yet, but really a great guy, great attitude and, and superb skill level, oh, yeah. e- even, even, and defensively too, just like phew, amazing his confidence with this defense. So wonderful. And he showed me something. He was like, okay, you know, hold me inside control. And he would hold me yes. from the bottom. And that shifted my perspective on that it's like why do i need to move it, you know in competition jiu-jitsu you need to be able to get on top you need to be able to to score the points you're in a t- compressed time frame but you know to be able to turn that so that okay you got me but you're not i won't let you do anything i'm not going to give you the space until you want to push and to play that push pull game from the bottom yeah that was more powerful than i thought yeah, like the the collar and it's basically the bicep and uh, the back of the neck, like really locking your elbows in. And Absolutely, and then and then you're like, I can't. Yeah. I, well, this doesn't feel right. There's a there's a there's a lot of cool stuff from there actually, like escapes, uh, using that bridge to sweep, waiting for like so a lot of guys from the top, they'll they'll get frustrated and try to pick you up for the crossbody armbar, and you wind up you can return your own armbar right from there. You can get yes, your, yeah, 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 get totally your guard back. Um, what was uh, the only the, the cool caveat there was if they if you hold that collar and elbow like the way that he yeah. ran the, the the old school Gracie way mm-hmm. is once the guy goes mount that's where you wind up in trouble so you have as soon as soon as they step over from mount until they almost escape to grab that the near leg and stuff him in the half guard yeah otherwise you're heading arm choke quick mm, so yeah, yeah, yeah. once they step over i see mount, what you're saying i see what you're like, saying like that's where like it can be dangerous territory and especially when you're holding that tight like you can really lock your legs out especially like a longer dude yeah you can be really screwed like just really ducking like pummeling into head and arm mm. so like Whenever I would use that a lot, especially on like big bruiser wrestling, sure, types, sure, sure, because they're they're for sure when they get you in that position, they're going to finish you. And like, I'm happy there because okay, now I'm smashing from the bottom, and I'm all I'm doing is using your weight to make it worse. But once they step over to mount, it's like I'm quickly grabbing that pant leg and fishing for half guard. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. otherwise, you're screwed. You're just screwed. <laughs> it's just bad. But it's you know, I mean, it just shows like the depth of like, oh, the, these defensive. At first, it's all about offense. Like, man, I want to tap people. I want to physically positionally dominate people and then other things become more interesting the defense becomes more interesting the never getting out of your specific game style gets more interesting i mean it's the journey is still interesting i'm like oh, totally. what, many years into it and it's still still fascinating i think i spent a month earlier last this year the beginning of the year or maybe under a year ago we'll say uh-huh. just not getting my open guard passed I wasn't trying to sweep. I was looking for a very specific position. Yeah. If that would happen, then I would act. I would sweep and I would go for this one technique. But everything else, I was just very calmly not letting my guard get past. Just hip escapes, framing, a scream, a square up, a scream, a square Dude, up. Dude, and isn't it wonderful as yeah. a black belt to be able to work on little projects like that yeah. in, in your, you know, in cool. your matted woodshed, like where you can you can work on this specific thing. You really dial that in. You can sand it so it's silky smooth yeah i I mean i can appreciate that maybe to some of my training partners it might have been annoying but it's like on the 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 devil's advocate no no no, pass my guard like do your best stuff like smash the hell out of me like whatever because i'm i would my only objective was to use the the technique and energy that their attack required i'm not inverting going like yeah yeah, yeah. 10 whatever it was 12 to 4 or whatever whatever the hell it is where you Mm -hmm. go all the way upside down to try to defend no like if it was just a matter of me hipping a little bit out of the way that's all i would do yeah and it was just me uh working on not uh letting the emotional or the uh, energy level escalate past what was that is so good you're in control you're like bringing it back down and you're mirroring you know like i've i've had a lot of I've had a lot of people roll cool with me, but you know, some people go a little crazy yep. and, uh, you know, as a black belt, you've had that happen many a time. And there's something about 
mirroring where I will just give you the energy you give me, yep. but I'm going to protect myself. Okay. So if you go, if you go crazy, I will give you a taste of that. Sure. The, the full and you know, and sometimes you get complaints after like, well, were you angry? Like, why'd you go so hard? It's like, I'm just my friend. You don't understand how hard you were going. Yeah. You know? And, and I think the ability to mirror and then because you're mirroring, you're not coming in at a lower energy level. You're matching and then pulling them back down. And that's the beauty. Instead of amping it up and escalating the situation, by mirroring and practicing mirroring, you can pull pe people into a different feel and a different tempo. Yeah. it's uh, I feel like it's a really healthy way to roll with some people. Um, it's I, I've noticed like the, the, there's some characteristics like you'll have people that go really really hard, but when you respond, then then all of a sudden they back off substantially. Then like they almost give you submissions. Like you feel that they the, yeah yeah yeah. yeah. I, oh man, I hate it. I, I I hate it so. Like once you can feel that they've already they they feel like they've been defeated already, and then they just they start training. Dude, differently I know with you. I know exact. Or oh. you know, or if they have the upper hand, yeah, they go a hundred and ten percent. Yeah. And then if you escape, then they just collapse. They mentally and physically collapse. So like, oh no, now you're on top. Uh, you, yeah. you know, and, and there's something, maybe a discussion needs to take place when those things happen. Now I've, I've been in positions where, you know, I haven't had that talk. I just kind of observed what just happened. But, you know, I think a, a discussion is merited where you, you say, look, don't die. You know, yeah. keep going, match my energy, and and don't mentally submit. Yeah, it, because it just becomes like this flow rolling thing where it's not even, it's like mock training. And it, yeah. I don't know. It, it's good for the first roll. Yeah. Warming up. But once you're in there, I've had a, a numerous occasions where I'd have a good first roll with somebody and they'd be matching me like they'd be doing really really well uh -huh. and then i'd get a submission and then i'd wind up tapping them like six times in a row afterwards like dude but not even hard just like they just fall into stuff and you can tell they're being very passive at this point like very docile i'm like oh come on they're intimidated by your guns dude. it just bummed me out it's just like come on just just do something like you you almost had me and yeah then you just, you just yeah it's a fine line between respect and passivity i suppose or, or just kind of like folding and and nobody likes if you got a bad hand you can fold yeah you know yeah. i'll tap early if i'm in a submission i'm like oh man you got that that was good but it was earned yeah. you know they earned that oh completely it's just you see they just sort of lose faith in themselves or like the fear kicks in or some some emotional thing yeah. happened where they just sort of give it i'm like oh man that sucks but uh but you know as as a black belt i, I think it's for us to kind of coach them through that. Like, Hey, so what's going on here? Well, you know, just so it's more um, beneficial to everybody. Yeah. There's, there's, there's all different kinds of personalities. It's, it's, it's funny when people, they do the blog to like generalize like the 10 people you meet in jujitsu or the, these are, the, <laughs> there's the guy that smells bad or this, that, or the other, like I was, it's always funny. Um, yeah. But there, there are a lot of like personality quirks. You see there, there's, there's a commonality and, how fear has its thing and you have uh, the, the guy that's always worried about belts and stuff and there's there's a lot of like these like common traits that you see across the the art or the sport but mm -hmm. um man so I, I you had this uh you know this uh, the podcast with the aikido thing and the joe Ro like what was the thing with the joe rogan thing I, I, I keep seeing it on youtube what was the uh what was the gist of the message there like was it the down to the relevance of aikido as an effective art or what was like in a nutshell yeah in a nutshell i felt like after the passing of stanley prannon who ran aikido journal aikidojournal.com um were kind of and the passing of another great teacher named chiba um we're at a generational shift with Aikido and Joe had a neuroscientist on a show who was, uh, you know, well versed in, but he, he, he was talking about Aikido and Joe was kind of doubting him. And the guy gave some uh, incorrect information and he had a different understanding of what the art was. Uh, whereas I feel I have, I'm probably the most qualified person to talk, to really discuss Aikido because I've, I've black belt Aikido. I've trained arts that, that Aikido came from 
as well as you know my judo and BJJ experience. It's a good it's a good perspective because it's it's not going to be one side or sided or biased, and you're going to be able to speak to the people from those individual arts and be like with a with a Absolute. commonality or with a common absolutely ground. it's the same common knowledge uh, a common language a convergence right yeah there, there is definitely a convergence and i feel like you know he's a traditional martial artist uh he likes traditional martial arts he likes mma i really felt that i could have i can turn him i can turn him into an aikido fan if if i can just contextualize what that training method is what the art is the path that it offers and what it isn't a lot of people have misunderstood within aikido have a misunderstanding of what it actually is but it's definitely um it's real uh it can be a spiritual path it's a, a true budo um it's an excellent training method for understanding flow and how to blend with forces that are greater than you and it's also uh a wide open door for people to explore Japanese martial arts, whereas BJJ, and it's it's a smaller window. Not everyone can do it at the same level, especially if you're in a competitive school. Yeah, the majority of BJJ. Yeah, I can't speak to judo really, but the majority of BJJ is so focused on being cutting edge, the YouTube current thing. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to learn the latest and mm -hmm. greatest. Uh, and there's little, uh, res I don't want to say respect, but I want to say a little mention or acknowledgement to the legacy. Like we we have the idols of the of the art of the sport that yeah. you know, from Jiro Kano to uh, to Mitsumaeda, Kanchikoma, mm -hmm. uh, then you know Carlos, Elio, and so forth. And cool, but leading up before that and how things started, how jujitsu kind of broke off into judo and, and into jujitsu and then came to Brazil and came to the United States and all this stuff, that stuff isn't really gone into as much. There are, there are some people out there. I, I just had the pleasure of sitting down with Pedro Valente and his, mm. his family does have an entire library and museum sort of dedicated to this. And he, there is much more significance and sort of, uh, attention given to the Japanese roots of it there. Fantastic. Um, it, it, I, I can't post uh, the, some of the stuff uh, taking photos of, but once their museum there, because they, they built a beautiful academy in, uh, in mm -hmm. North Miami Beach, once that stuff's online, you'll sort of sort of start to see the the Japanese influence in a lot of their stuff, and uh, it's really funny. Um, they actually have the scroll of photos. We didn't get to really talk about much, um, but it was basically the early Carlos and Elio training, like. Uh, basically oh. how to how to teach this stuff like yeah. this technique and there were multiple things on uh, ankle foot locks and even heel hooks back in the 50s awesome. so saying that jujitsu and you know leg locks and stuff like that it's like the even wrist locks were in there because they teach a self-defense curriculum they're not out there teaching a sport right they're, they're very forthcoming about that right they're, if you want to go da, 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 go over there that's mm -hmm, where you do it mm -hmm. if you want to compete go see this guy or that guy that's fine mm -hmm. but for them they're teaching a uh to, to them they believe a complete fighting system which does have strikes which does have the weapon disarming yes it, and it does have the throws like they had, they were teaching a bunch of judo techniques and there are wrist locks right if you get what, grabbed what they're showing is much more like the traditional japanese jiu-jitsu and the gi's a little different too it, it, it's not the the one that we wear right it's a little it does have lapels you can grab it but it has almost like a canvas kind of uh, karate uh gi feel mm. to it. it's, it's much lighter but uh yeah like you said it's it's closer to what uh the uh the jujitsu was before it was broken into uh you know judo and jujitsu and i think that's incredibly important to preserve that to yeah. preserve the kind of traditional self-defense, street fight mentality um, that traditional Grace Jiu-Jitsu does, what the Valente brothers do, um, and really, how is Aikido any different than that? When it comes to when it comes to preserving martial traditions, um, you know, we can always you know have a plug-in. We can have a little added module that people can do or not do if they want a more complete. But just just because people aren't using a specific programming language doesn't mean that programming language doesn't work anymore. You know, it, it, it can still work. It can still work. And um, I think just having the opportunity to be able to discuss with him on or off the air, I, I think it would be enlightening to him. And I think it would be I think it would be a service to the martial arts in general. 
I, I think so. I mean, we, we both have a common uh, friend, Henry Akins, right? Mm-hmm. So his training is still very traditional, uh, Hicks and Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Yes. But his adaptations, right? It, it was based on working as a bouncer in LA nightclubs for 15 years. Yeah. You know, having really tough customers come up to you. And as a, a Jiu Jitsu guy, like we're all built differently, but mm-hmm. there's some bruisers over there. And just having the, uh, the experience in that industry with Jiu Jitsu, like, He's using wrist locks all the time. Yeah, and we're that like that's his self defense stuff has as, as much roots in Aikido as it does in anything else. Mm-hmm. If you're, you're you're being grabbed, and how do you deal with that? How what does space management look like when we're not in this controlled two points here, three points here, one advantage here environment? So even his grip defense, he you know a lot of judo or jiu jitsu guys were going two on one try to break the grip. Yeah, yeah. Well, two on one right here means that he still has one hand to hit. Totally, him. totally. So he's here and here, but he's using wrist manipulation to to do that as well. And that, awesome. That's it's you're, it's as much blocking the strike to blocking the strike into a lot of standing like attacks, mm. and then there's wrist attacks that go with that. And so it's it's a it's a very uh, thoughtful solution. Uh, to to some so self defense problems, but where did that come from? Right, that's early jujitsu, that's early aikido, that's all, totally right. So totally saying you know one because they don't actively use as many wrist locks in competition, um, they're there, they're legal at you know the upper belt levels, and they hurt real bad. Oh yeah, they hurt re- <laughs> wrist, wrist locks suck. Like if you if you aren't expecting it, like you you haven't had it done to you. Oh, totally, yeah, you're done for a while. <laughs> so it's uh you know there's i, I don't think just people poo-pooing something because of hearsay or because this that or the other thing is 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 the right thing to do i think there's there's valid technique in all of these arts and absolutely and so much of it is feel right you can't see pressure when you watch your video but yeah i mean you can hear moaning you can hear uh, labored breathing but the casual observer without understanding the pressure that the person on the bottom is feeling, they'd be like, why don't the guy just stand up? Oh, yeah, right. No. And Aikido is, is very similar in that you're not feeling what that person is feeling. Have somebody grab you by the pinky and tell me that <laughs> you, you, everything's all good. Right. The, 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 the small joint manipulation that you have that in Aikido. Yeah. You do. Yeah. They don't do that much with a uh, Yubidori or, or finger techniques. So there's a little, little bit that some teachers touch on but it's mainly the four or five major wrist locks but uh i mean if you get somebody who's very very skilled at that stuff and they do a nikio uh, which is like a some people call it the s lock where you you have the wrist and then it's turned back into you oh, yeah. dude there's nothing else you can think about in the world except that pain if a master applies that to you ev- all other thoughts go out the window and all you can think is like that it, it takes your mind totally. Oh, and in gi competition, it's amazing. It was because everybody has the Frankenstein, the, the death grip on you and just popping the wrist and coming in and hugging that elbow. Oh yeah. They're, oh yeah. 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 Under, dude, underrated. These things are underrated. And you know, as people continue to look for the advantage, um, wrist locks, heel hooks, unexpected back entries, all these things come into vogue and then fade out. Yeah. You know, it's, it's part of the cycle and we're just, we happen to find ourselves in the cycle. And I think if we can just intelligently navigate where we are, understand where, where we're at in the universe, in this universal jujitsu cycle, then I think we'll just have a better perspective and we can appreciate where we're at, where we're going, where we came from. Isn't it crazy? We, we talked about this a little bit last night when we were over dinner that, you know, a hundred years ago, we were, you know, we were splitting off between, you know, basically jujitsu and judo uh, in Japanese jujitsu and judo and now Brazilian jujitsu or whatever we're calling it, jujitsu with an eye in the middle. Yeah. Um, is now they're they're looking at well is it you know what's better you know self defense or sport and you have the splintered sort of uh you know you know there's there's schools that do one or the other and some do both which is challenging right right but it's it it exists uh, so it's basically come full circle in that the art splintered off because of this you know are we doing one thing or the other and a hundred years later we're still talking about the same thing we're just doing it on Reddit. And we're just wearing a fancy uh, kimono or a pair of shorts and a, a rash guard, right? So we're still talking about the same thing for 100 years. We're just using different terms and uh, different rules, basically. The vanity of minor differences. Yeah, that's all. It's, it's, the same, it's the same damn discussion about the same damn martial art. 
Yes. We just have better takedowns. Out. And, and it will, <laughs> and it'll continue. It'll, it'll continue, uh, you know, a hundred years into the future, submission fighting jujitsu may be a, uh, I mean, I personally would like to see it more like what they did in the Middle East, where it's a required part of physical education in schools and elementary schools uh, to to teach jujitsu as physical literacy. And I mean, we teach reading and writing. Why not teach a little bit of physical literacy? Why not institute a little bit more financial literacy into schools? We need a total revamp of our educational system. Oh, and sure. I do feel that jujitsu is part of the answer. It is. I'm wondering how rear naked chokes would work with some of the, uh, the troubled children. A well-armed society is a polite society. It's but to true. arm yourself without arms would be ideal. Yeah, that's true. In, in an ideal world. It, in an ideal it, world. It would be. Or maybe, or maybe it's just the, uh, maybe it's a meritocracy based on, on um, the best students, the people that have proven themselves worthy. I mean, jiu-jitsu can be a transformational vehicle as well. But as we discussed earlier, not, not everyone that achieves a high level in jiu-jitsu is, um, it's a paragon of virtue. You know, it's, it, it's not always that way, but it does help mold people. And if you get bullies, you need someone who's equally skilled, but just with a different, um, w- with a different viewpoint to, to be able to uh, protect them. Yeah. I mean, whenever you have some like a bad apple or just an angry mm-hmm. person or otherwise disturbed person or just, just a dick coming into a jujitsu academy, um, nature kind of takes its course sure. and they, they either uh, transform or they uh, transition to some other place. Yeah. Right? They don't right, last. Yeah. They generally don't last. They blend with a pack or they get, you know, yeah, chased out. Yeah. I, I believe that jujitsu, jujitsu is like the last honest job, right? It's your place in the pack uh, where you exist, coexist, whatever is based on performance, based on what you do. What, what you do, knowledge, uh, you know, but it's not just knowledge. It's definitely a performance-based martial oh. art. And it's, it, it is a true meritocracy. It's like, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be a garbage man, and people respect you for who you are in that room, the individual you are, the skill level you bring, your contribution to the group. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's all recognized, and it's truly the most honest conversation you'll have all day. It's, oh, totally. I mean, just anywhere you go in the world, um, you can drop into a jujitsu academy and you're not talking about reds or blues or black or white or, you know, uh, black lives matter. You're not talking about uh, the Middle East stuff. You're, you're, you're just on the mat. Yeah. And Shut up with your politics. Yeah. Let me choke you now. Yeah. And it, everyone kind of just gets along and has that respect because, you know, in the bonds you sort of make in training because you're doing something hard. Right, and you got through it together, and there's almost a, like a shared bond where you're going to be friends Absolutely. with those people forever. Absolutely, and that's evolutionary psychology, and and like the 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 satisfaction that we have with struggle. And now in this day, we need to, you know, we're not struggling to settle the West. We're not struggling for the next meal. It's all. I mean, people work hard, and there is despair, and there is struggle in the society, but the ability to bond with other people and to struggle in unison with them, and then. Um, you know, essentially form a tribe. I mean, it, it's incredibly satisfying. I was just talking to a friend the other day um, who's done some martial arts. We've trained a little bit, but he's like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I prefer my combat, not so close contact. And I was like, dude, it's a secret of happiness. The connection, the bonding, the respect, you know, men need respect and one place you get it, it doesn't matter if you're rich or not. A lot of rich kids go into jujitsu because they know it's, it's earned. It's yeah. earned and they can get a level of respect from other people that has nothing to do with who, what family they were born into or their bank account, or it is, it's something pure. Yeah, it, it really is. There's a, uh... There's there's a lot of uh, yeah, I guess misconceptions uh, you know about the the space thing and honestly there's a lot of people that are afraid of it a lot of women are intimidated of actually going and training of course man most women are not into that level of proximity that close proximity is no. is a disqualifier 
and yeah, and that's it's 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 unfortunate, but uh, you know, there it's it's better than it was. There's way more women training now. Um, Henner's doing an awesome job, man. Those yeah. women empowered classes. There's a hundred plus women in each one of those classes, and they're learning a, a really great skill. They're learning uh, they're, they're, they are being empowered. The confidence boost that like we get as guys you know, coming out of a, one of these classes, like you just did something really difficult. I look better. I feel better. I learned something mm -hmm. and I'm better than I was last week. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, that feeling of accomplishment, that feeling of that euphoric feeling of you just trained, um, everything hurts, but, and all you're really worried about is that the, your shower, your bottle of water and your next meal, like the world becomes simple. Uh, the, the things that would otherwise be the little things that really bug people. Of course. They're gone. They're out the window. You're thinking about these very primal things. What does my body absolutely need right now to, to come to some sort of, you know, uh, homeostasis, to come to some baseline, just like a, what do I absolutely need, right? Absolutely. And that is be here now. That is a forced um, uh, convergence of, attention in the moment just being present right J and and there's no reason to look outside that moment or spin yourself up into some anxious state worrying about the future or the past or and if nothing but now yeah nothing but now yeah just just being there then um it's it's a it shouldn't have to be such a skill but it, i think it does i think it has to be taught well, I think it's a skill to also create an environment where people can can get that, bring it into their lives repeatedly, and then also be able to um, to retain them for a long period of time, where they can actually they can gain the skill level, but then they also have the, the kind of social bonds and and to create an environment like that that lasts a long time. Um, I think that's that's also another another skill, and you know, proper instruction is a skill. Absolutely, you know, well, whether it's maintenance of the physical space or um, being able to pass on and communicate the techniques and the concepts in the right way. And it's not about information overload; it's about delivering the right information, the critical detail that that person needs for that technique that is well suited to their body type and their game, wherever their game happens to be right then. It takes a it takes a long time to get that perspective, as opposed to this is what I do, yeah. do this. It's a totally different level. Yeah, there's there's a lot of that. There's a lot of well, this is the newest thing on YouTube, and the, my students clearly are going to want that. Otherwise, they're going to go somewhere else and get it, and blah blah blah. And this is the wrong approach. I feel like too many instructors are up there trying to entertain their students, right? To to put on some sort of like show, as opposed to teaching oh. them what they need. Yes. I would rather um, warm everybody up, get everybody through a warm up, get everybody, you know, make sure their necks, knees, backs are all, you know, nice and fluid. Mm -hmm. right? Make sure everybody's joints are nice and lubed up. Um, get through some drilling. I would rather have them do some closed guard pass drill for 10 minutes to just like, okay, let, let's see if I can see a common deficiency. Let's see if we can see something that these guys need help on right now with something that's very simple that. that it could be very complex, but just something simple that everyone needs right now. I would rather do that as my class than go and sit there and, okay, let's come up with the most exotic. No, this is, this is a waste of time. I, I don't need them to be me. I need them to be better than me. So by me having the perspective of what I learned and to watch them, how they're doing, handling the situation, it's like, okay, well, here's something that I yeah. saw that we need to work on. Teach for them, not for you. Exactly. Like they're supposed to be better than me. Like the athletes of now, like today's the the young yeah. people now, they're better than us. Like in genetics, oh they're just they're way better than us. So to be able to pass on some insight and to help them to sort of grow and to be better, I want them to be better. Yeah. What else am I why why else would I be there? Like the, there's world champions. They see them on TV all the time. Like they might want to be one. They mm -hmm. might like, and uh, the self-defense stuff, like they are going to want families at some point. They want to be able to protect them. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain level of responsibility. Like, yeah, I want them to be as good as they possibly can. And as good as they want to be. Is like, right. If they're willing to work for it. Like I want to help to nurture that, to, to do what I can to enable them and empower them to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. And even if they don't want to go all the way to a national or world okay. championship or the Olympic team, to arm them with the skill sure and then they can apply that you know if they if they want recreationally uh, it'll always be there instinct instinctually uh, it, it's 
it's right there, ready for use whenever they need it. In, in, in terms of if they want to compete or not, I'm never going to force anybody to do anything. Nobody can force anyone to do anything. Like, I don't, people are free will. It's a bitch. That's it. Mm -hmm. But the opportunity for them to go out there and to face something they're afraid of and to overcome it, I wouldn't want to do them the disservice of not giving them that opportunity. And right. So I, I feel that does a lot for personal growth. Um, you know, people are going to have children at some point and being able to know how do you respond to fight or flight? How do you respond to somebody is in front of you and they are trying to hurt you? Totally. So like, I, I think competition is a good thing. I think at least experiencing it once or twice and overcome that, overcome those jitters and the, mm. do you just sit there? There are do, some serious nerves involved. Yeah. Like just giving people the opportunity to do that. I feel like it's a great life skill. It's a great opportunity. If they get a medal out of it, they, the, the feeling of winning is great. So mm -hmm. having that is something, you know, I, I think that's cool. I think everybody should go through that. If they don't want to, it's fine, but I, I encourage it. Um, and if people bring it up, then I'm right behind them. I'll coach them. I'll be right there yelling and posture, break his grip. Same yeah. basic stuff. You yeah. Know, everybody that doesn't listen. Mm. <laughs> Hopefully they listen. Um, they listen. They always listen to the master's voice and they can pick it out of a crowd. Um, I'm, I'm annoying. I'm very loud. I, I got very, the people look at me when I'm coaching. They're just, mm -hmm. just angry, loud. Let the passion out. Oh, it's I, all good. I yell. I, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not inappropriate. I don't curse or anything like that, but uh -huh. I, I am loud. But, um, man. So it's, it's crazy. Uh, I want to get back a little bit. I, I first, uh, found you online. Uh, you're at the time when YouTube wasn't really a thing. You were like the, one of the main people out there with the DVDs. Um, you were the first person to really make it clear what the hell a blue belt is. Yes. Like what's a purple belt? Like mm -hmm. what are people looking for? And while like the criteria isn't the same everywhere, obviously sure it, your blue belt, uh, instructional or your, uh, is the blue belt requirements, blue belt requirements, DVD, it's a two DV, two DVD set. I, I got before there was such a thing as an app uh, right. like 10 years ago or something. And, uh, this is, it, it was all we really had to kind of go by because mm -hmm. it was, a, nobody talked about belts. You could never ask any, an instructor a belt question. It was like, sure. it was unheard of. Um, so I, I bought that years ago and, uh, Rick uh, Kingsbury, I, I lent it to him and a few other guys. And that was, it was a really helpful tool, but, and, and even back then, like the quality of these videos, I look at what I'm putting out there and I'm, I'm not the best video editing guy. I'm, I'm I, in terms of audio, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with my work. I'm happy uh -huh. with my work, but the, the video stuff's always been really impressive. I was it really admired that. And then the actual, the quality of the, uh, the instructionals of these tests that, the, that your students would take, yeah. which is very unique uh, to, I, I didn't see it at a lot of schools. I didn't see it at mine, but the, it, it was some really impressive stuff. So I, I've always been a big fan of that. Um, so you, you had a, you must have had a, a really long production, video production career going into, like, how are you able to produce like these high quality videos? Like, and a lot of them. Yeah. Well, Number one, I, I, we had a discussion about like competitive advantage. Like, would I want to put my energy into being a, a full-time competitor or is my competitive advantage with my media background? And I think having a, the media background, um, I was a, an audio engineer before I, I went to school for, um, uh, it's a, basically a media degree. Um, so when I was an audio engineer, I learned about video editing. Um, I worked with some really great editors at a, at a very high end production studio. So they schooled me on that. And by the time I launched my jujitsu academy, I said, okay, the internet and being able to, um, produce media and multiply myself is going to be my ticket to success. So I put a lot of love into it and, um, my friend who's a bit of a creative partner, Rick Ellis, he, we, we made like, uh, we made blue belt requirements. I had another DVD before that year one seminars, which was kind of a, a soft seller. It, it did okay. But blue belt requirements, who doesn't want to be a blue belt? No, exactly. And I was a white belt for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So when I, I'm, like, I'm buying this damn thing. Uh, at first I, I was like, I don't need this. And then after a while I'm like, no, I'm, I'm yeah. for sure buying this thing. And I still actually, I, we all use all of the fundamentals, but I, I use uh, your variation of the mount escape where you sort of step over the far ankle and oh yeah, you, you kind of the leg the, drag. Yeah, yeah, I still use that mount escape all the time. It's it's 
one of my favorites. It's way less work. It's way less work. It's, it's way, way less, less work. work. And all credit to my instructor, Roy Harris, who codified a lot of these techniques, laid them out. Blue belt requirements was essentially just his blue belt requirements, but I just presented them um, very, very clearly. And then, and then off of that, that was really popular and successful. And then I decided, okay, I need to do the whole belt series. Um, which I did. And, you know, I've continued with media um, and producing. And every time I do a new project, it's got to be better. Everything is themed differently. You know, it, they, they have different colors. They have a different feel. Um, now my emphasis is much more I'm, I'm traveling all over the place. Uh, and for all of my trips, I'm doing uh, something called Destinations, um, the world of jiu-jitsu. Cool. And so now I folded my latest uh, Moscow, the art jiu-jitsu in Russia. That folded into this project. We have Coachella, jiu-jitsu in the desert, uh, that episodic series that I, I've done. Also, uh, on my upcoming trip to Europe, um, I'm going to Germany, Italy, and Norway. And I'll be filming there. And I'm really excited about um, just being able to share what I'm doing with people at home where I can get a little bit more of the feel of the place, make it a bit more Anthony Bourdain style. Awesome. Yeah, it, it, it should be good. And, you know, it's offered me the chance to connect with a lot of people, you know, uh, YouTube changed my life. Blue belt requirements changed my life. But when it comes right down to it, we're still even the most popular YouTube jujitsu celebrity is small potatoes compared to uh a lot of people online oh it's true there's and it's it's kind of crazy um and there's there's people that are great at youtube and monetization and producing content uh the stuff that gets over with the masses or is watched by the most people isn't necessarily the best content it's controversial a lot it's entertaining right absolutely very clickbaity a very you know and i made a conscious decision to not go that route where it's all about the work it's art for me the academy itself was a long-term art project and doing all of those belt demonstrations was dude it was a lot of work but i wanted to show the world hey these are my standards and here it is people creating an open source transparent environment that people could look at and judge or be inspired by Yep. And it was a little bit, I, I kind of created a monster for myself. I've edited plenty, but then I would train people. I'd have different um, assistants that I would, I would hire and train and teach them the art of video editing and the art of audio mixing and then putting that together. So, I mean, I've, I've trained a lot of people over the years to be able to assist me with the, this, this process. Because you're, I mean, you are, I wanted to say essentially, but you're exactly a filmmaker that's also out there doing jujitsu. So, I mean, you're, you're making these videos and yeah, it's one thing you're, you're doing instructionals and they're great instructionals and you're, you're showing your students belt testing, but then you take it a step forward or further and you have uh, a lot of people wouldn't have this, this courage or this confidence in their own ability. Your third and second degree black belt uh, tests, your personal tests are out there as videos as well. Mm -hmm. So your performance with all of your students with other black belts, other brown belts, really good guys is out there. And you're basically, you're, you're doing the filmmaking stuff, but you're also like, well, here's me doing it too. So I'm actually out here. I'm, I'm, I'm not just a filmmaker. I'm like, I'm, I'm actually this jujitsu, like a very accomplished uh, martial artist. And here's me on the mat now. Uh, and I'm not 25. I'm not 21. Like I'm, I'm, yeah. a, like I've been doing this a while now, but you're still out there kicking ass. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a testament to the work. And I, I know, training is a job and then doing a podcast is another job but then editing and like we talked before i've got so much footage yeah of, of all this like i've been traveling a lot this year mm -hmm. and i have so much crap i need to put out there and to me at, at this point uh, I want to go through and I really want to present it in a certain way. Like the audio interviews are great. Uh, the guys that subscribe, I love my subscribers. Uh, they, they know all my stuff. It's, it's weird. Like actually having fans now, like yeah. getting requests for stuff. Mm -hmm. I had stopped in an airport recently. Which awesome. Was weird. Awesome. Um, yeah, it's, it's cool, but it's, uh, it's just the audio stuff. Cause I know on YouTube, I'm, I'm not, I'm not using the, the footage I have cause most people just hear the podcast and that's it. Um, but there's a huge audience out there that doesn't, 
let's be honest, you don't have to be very technical to use YouTube. It's, right. the, it's the second largest search engine in the world. Mm -hmm. But to, to get a podcast, like everyone's phone's a little different. So I, you need this link, you need this link. You, and the majority of people aren't as technical as we think. Yeah. The younger people are. They'll mm -hmm. figure it out. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's it's such a niche audience. And I'm, I'm looking more, I, I love the jujitsu world, but my goal is to make that a much larger world. And, Absolutely. And, and that's, I think we're aligned there because I, I want to cross over. I want to be more mainstream. Yeah. I, I think jujitsu is a cool base art and incredibly powerful. And it's something, dude, I mean, you're legit or you're not. You're legit or you're not. You're, you, you know your stuff or you're not. Uh, you know, and, and there are, it's just something that's earned. Um, and when it comes to being able to communicate that message to more people, and being able to cross over, I think it could be, um, I think that could be really powerful. And in a way, someone like, well, let's go back to um, Anthony Bourdain. Um, he's done so much for adventure travel, for the um, art of cuisine. Culinary arts. Culinary yeah. arts, you know, and, and just kind of merging the synthesis of those things. Um, I think it's... I think that's the future. It's all about synthesizing different disciplines, different passions. And the passion's the key word with Anthony Bourdain. The, the big thing here is honesty. He's very transparent. I, I think his episode in Cape Cod or in uh, the outskirts of Boston, like right there, uh -huh. it was, it was, and his, his episode in Tokyo was, or in Japan in general was amazing as well. But in his, he opened his episode in Cape Cod um, on showing the corner of some project y kind of area and you know at night it's dark and he said this is where i in 1970 something I, this is where i bought my first bag of heroin and it's like that's where he starts the episode it's like the most powerful dude thing. and he like so it starts talking about the opiate crisis and how all these people are you know sucked in by the addiction thing in this neighborhood and he, then he shows where he worked on the beach and talked about you know you know doing drugs on the beach and all this and it's just very like very honest he's like this is where i was at this point i worked in as a as a dishwasher in this restaurant this is where my career started this is where mm -hmm. i was then and it's when i found these certain things in my life blah 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 blah, blah. it's very mm -hmm. honest and that same honesty i feel like can be applied to jujitsu because it's like you can look at the camera and say wouldn't it be great if you had this thing that gave you more friends you can make friends anywhere real friends Real friends, really have real human connection with people. But wouldn't it be great too if you felt better and you lost weight and you look better and you liked yourself more? Wouldn't you like to be happier? Well, I have this thing that can give you that. And it isn't a lie. I'm not selling you And it's oil. not a lie. It's, it's the most honest thing I could say to you. I have that. We have and that. And it's more effective than any antidepressant. Totally. It's, it is literally the last honest job. And it does it take work? And it's not going to be replaced by and and that and this is this is why I feel like I feel a small calling to help prepare the next generation of jujitsu instructors because I I launched an academy I took criticism for it it was innovative um, it's progressive dude people the idea of a belt test you know how much hate mail I got over that but you know what now people I mean yet people would say man I secretly wish they did this at my school. You know, there, there's something, there's something about um, the authenticity of jujitsu. It's not going to be replaced with automation anytime soon. And you're, you're teaching people how to be more human. You're enhancing their humanity, their physicality, their um, social agreeableness, uh, because you have to work together in order to, to continue moving forward. Uh, and you're also enhancing neuroplasticity. This and thing. and allowing people to take in new information, discard information, and uh, and continue that learning process. Yeah, I mean, you have a lot of uh, people that start jujitsu. They're pretty darn stubborn, pretty bullheaded, and they leave, or you know, they grow into these pragmatic individuals that are thoughtful, that understand repercussion and consequence to their action and uh, oh. efficiency. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And and look, and then people. There's an appreciation. I mean, it happens in all arts, but in combat arts, well, you you have like everyone wants to be effective first. Sure. Then you be you want to be efficient, and then eventually the efficiency turns to playfulness, where it's more about yeah, you can be you can kick ass, but you want to have a good time doing it. 
you know, and it has to serve you in, in your, in the new role it has in your life. Um, but people get caught up in just being effective. Yeah. And, you know, and a lot of people don't even make it to being really efficient, but if you can, if you can, it shows you that there are levels and in a world where technology allows things to be democratized and everyone's voice is equivalent on the internet, but voices aren't equivalent experience right. isn't equivalent and being able to understand that there are levels and some levels take a very, very long time to get to. I mean, gymnastics in the Olympics looks effortless, but we know it is one of the, the most difficult things in the world. People make it look magical because they've put the time in to make it look magical. And I think that's important for people to understand, like before the traditional arrangement of an apprentice kind of illustrated what that was in any particular field. But um, now I, I think being able to, show people through hard work the levels of development that you can go through as an individual, as an artist, as an athlete. I think that can ripple out into other areas of their life. Oh, totally. The just the determination, the the diligence, the persistence, and then the patience. Uh, the pa patience is I say it's a virtue, but it's that's such an understatement when you you realize what it what it sort of takes, and just to have someone on top of you you've never been mounted before. And I, I'm always say to my new students when I'm teaching you know mount escapes, or even we're just drilling it. Look, you get mounted. And just about anywhere else in life, this is applicable. But if you're in a bad position, I'm always like, very simple. Stop. Breathe. Assess the situation and think, what can I do to make this just 1% better? Mm. Just 1%. And then that's where, okay, well, the guy's up in my armpits. I should probably fix that. We'll hit mm -hmm. back a little bit. We're, okay, he doesn't. A little at a time. Yeah, just 1%, 1%. Just But the stop and breathe and assess, assess the situation. That is so great. That is so great. I, look, you know, Dave Camarillo has, he had actually a great podcast on, you know, don't be so sensitive. Yeah. That can really, and I do feel like a lot of, not to single out millennials, but a lot of people are too sensitive these days and looking for outrage. And then if you look for outrage, you're going to find it. But when it comes right down to it, we need to be in that middle ground, not insensitive, but not too sensitive. And being able to calm people, desensitize people to that terrible position of being mounted and to remain calm and to assess and then take action. Yeah, listen. And perspectives, you know, it's, it, it, perspective is big. Um, there's way more end than or in the world. Yeah. There's way more end than or. And that sounds like a really salesy type thing to say. And I, I'm sure it's been used a hundred times. And there's more. Right. <laughs> And more, but there's more and than more. There's 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 many times when someone can say, blah blah blah, my point of view, and then no no no, blah blah. But really, the answer is someplace closer to the middle, without all the emotion. There's way more and than or. There's way more times where you can have two differing opinions that are not necessarily conflicting. They're not. It's not or. It can be end. And situations aren't always as polarizing or as divisive as we want them to be. Mm -hmm. I think with people's feelings being hurt, I think there's many parts to this. I think a big piece of it is uh, attention seeking, right? Everybody wants to be part of some big cause. Amen. Everybody wants to check in on Facebook Amen. or social media, which is gross because we are, we are in this voyeuristic uh, capitalistic Western society whereby anything I don't do to directly help me is directly hurting me, which is gross. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 propagated throughout the monetary system, throughout the the, the commercialism, throughout every even you know the, the going back. You watch anything on TV, which I don't have cable, and I'm glad I don't have cable. Um, yeah, it, it, everything becomes so divisive, and it's almost there's incentive to be triggered, right? There's there's incentive to it because they get attention on their social media. They get attention on their Instagram, their their YouTube channels, whatever. Finally, I have something to complain about. Yeah, look, now look at me. This happened, and it's so bad. And look how bad this other person is for blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And really, the louder person is going to, you know, the, the squeaky wheel gets the, the grease or the wrench, whatever the hell the analogy or, is. No, yeah, or the syrupy sympathy. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm, you got to be able to like, if you want to be in the public eye, you got to be able to swallow stuff. Yeah. You have to be able to swallow stuff and you can't be outraged. And people talk, people will talk, they'll say terrible things about you, and you have to swallow and nod and be, oh, I see. 
and move on with your day and keep on course, you know? And I think this social isolation that social media brings is rectified slightly by the group and tribe that you form in jujitsu, yeah. you know? And I think, again, it's another antidote to kind of modern day woes. And yeah, it's, I, I had to do a little reboot on social media. Like, what does it mean? Where's this going? Um, you know, occasionally you come into contact with people that live for social media. They're not living their life authentically anymore and capturing a few moments. All their energy is directed toward what will get me more attention. Yep. And then you're living for the Instagram shot rather than just experience life. I mean, this, this is a gift. Let's not, you know, let's not put the gift in, in a, a, a glass box and never touch it. Like, phew, live it, man. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny. People go and they spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars to these really, you know, big rock band concerts, right? And then they yeah. spend the whole time videoing the thing on a you know three inch screen. Dude, like you're ever gonna look at that? You're never gonna look at. You're that never gonna look at that ever. Be, and you know why? Because that same exact video produced beautifully is done by what's it, Vivo or whatever the the company. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you go online, it's in like 4K. It's beautiful. You can put it on like a theater screen. It's gonna look perfect and sound perfect. But no, your iPhone is gonna do. Well, just be there. Be there and be you, there in the moment, man. In the moment, and there's this. It's because people don't go to places to go to places. People go to places to tell people they went to places. That's that's exactly what's what's wrong. It's so gross. Just go. Uh, I haven't been taking as many pictures lately on these trips uh, because I kind of just want to be there, and I, I I don't have a full time photography crew with me. And you know maybe it's bad for the shows themselves. Huh. And there's specific things I'll, I'll see, and those are things that I want to capture on video because the, the the shot just looked like something. The sky was perfect. This building yeah. was perfect, and I want to I want to capture that. But I don't want a selfie stick in front of me 24 hours a day. Like I had the gimbal. I had the the. The, yeah. the the three axis sta stabilizer for people that don't that don't know it's basically a stabilizer for either a camera or an iPhone or Android where you, you, it doesn't shake you can walk around and it looks like a steady cam like a like a theatric mm -hmm. cinematic kind mm -hmm. of look and I had that thing and I would bring it to training and I'd have you know my guys doing their thing and I'm holding this thing like I, I felt like such a dumbass like I just I need to be here I need to be teaching these guys like I I'm not a 21 year old social media girl, whatever. I'm yeah, not, totally. I'm, I'm like this, you know, <laughs> totally mid thirties dude teaching this class. And it's way more important for me to go over there and be like, dude, your arm, come here, fix your arm bar. You need to be over here, not over here. Um, then holding this thing like, Hey, look at me on Instagram. Like, Hard to be in the moment and capture the moment. Like, unless I have like a full camera crew, which is ridiculous too. I think being present is way more valuable and it made me feel better. Yeah. So I think there'll be a movement. I think we're heading toward a movement movement anti-social media organic connection it's like the slow food movement it's like a slow life movement life as it actually is occasionally captured and celebrated and shared with others yeah I, but not every minute detail I, I feel like the businesses uh that are really going to be successful in the coming 10 years are going to be the one that productize human being a human being like per, the, that human touch is a service that when you go in there you feel like that person knows me like they're in we're in the same neighborhood yeah not the best buy thing we're like oh yeah we match fry store prices here go here go here or they just ignore you or whatever mm -hmm. just that you have a human experience and uh, that that a person knows you and so for me unless i'm on the road i don't really leave my own neighborhood i have my jujitsu gym the gro i have a local grocery store right there mm -hmm. i have a diner i go to uh from time to time to get food they and i know i don't have to order they know what i eat like there's no discussion it's I just love here that. i love that and there, my comic book store is right behind my house i have a mailbox there like every everything i need is right within 0.1 mile of my door and a lot of people live their entire lives that way like in other countries and they never leave the village and it's totally it's a great life it's a great life and there's there's something beautiful about that about keeping local it's i i like having a sense of community um i i feel that a lot of the studies being done now on the, the size of the tribe, the size of the community yeah. uh, being too large and actually being responsible for a lot of the mental illness. You see being responsible for a lot of the anxiety, the, 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 the sort of um, 
the, the weird behavior you see when you have groups of people that are just too large, like just people snapping, right? You know, going postal, right? Too many people. They're interacting with too many people. Um, they showed this with rodents, right? Mm. Where there's this X plus one uh, number of rodents in a, a small in a terrarium or a community. Mm. Where you start seeing the the mental uh, the, the the mental illness, like the, the the weird behavior, the antisocial behavior, the self harm. Mm. You, know, you see it in rodents, and hey, if they'll test perfume on them, good enough for us, right? So well, there they, they must, be, must be a one to one. I'm de- I'm definitely <laughs> I'm definitely taking some kind of lesson from that. And there's there is something. There, you know, the size of the tribe, um, and this kind of uh, endless onslaught of digital projection of like how happy people are in their lives. It's almost the more you project, yeah, the less happy you are. Uh, I'm not saying that's with everybody, but but there is there is something to that. No, there's, there's a parallel. And I think a lot of the projection is sort of, uh, inward therapeutic type stuff. Like you're trying to like, well, let's look at the bright side of this X, Y, and Z suck, but one, two, and three over here, these moments made me happy. So that self-reflection on those positive experiences that they project outwards on the social media platforms, the YouTube and stuff. I feel like it's somehow their own version of therapy. Like they're trying to look at glass half full as, as opposed to maybe, you know, these, these things suck. I'm miserable because of these other things, but mm-hmm. uh, to some level, I think, uh, yeah, there's, there's definite parallels to it. I, I don't know if it's a one-to-one correlation, but to, if you look at people's Instagram and stuff, uh, a lot are very, very positive because it's cool to be like the motivational speaker guy now to, you know, the, the rah, rah thing. That's a thing. Now you have 21 year olds going on Instagram, trying to t- teach you life lessons about yeah, things. I want a life coach who's done nothing before. Yeah, that's great. Uh, <laughs> well, well, no, where did you come from? My parents' house. I'm sorry. Um, you know, with all due respect to your parents, I'm sure they're lovely people. Um, I'm probably going to take my, uh, own cues from my life experiences, which is like twice as much time on this planet. And that means twice as much mistakes. I've been wrong so many times. I'm wrong all the time. I, and I'm fine with it. It's cool because I get to learn from that and then just do it better later. Yeah, I, I don't care. I'm I, I'm called. I'm probably called out, called wrong on stuff I say on here all the time. Cool, that's cool. Um, I'm probably not going to sit there and debate it. Uh, but you, if I, you, one, well, you can't get down the weeds like that. And two, yeah, sometimes we are incorrect, and then you say, you know, I'm sorry, I was incorrect on that. It's all about having move on. having an open mind and being able to to self-correct self-correction well it's 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 honestly and when i come right down to brass tacks it's not that important to me to convince anyone of anything it's not if someone is harming themselves and they're very and they're important yeah. to me, i believe in the preservation of life above all else above all things i i, I believe you know, life is sacred blah 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 i'm not getting political i'm not talking about that sure, sure. but what i mean is that if someone needs help I'm, i'll be there i, I want to help i want people to feel better but not to my own harm, not to my own detriment. You know, like, mm-hmm. I'm not going to sweat over somebody telling me that, oh, well, uh, it's why I don't watch like MMA fights in bars. I'm not like a big bar guy anyway. Yeah. But they sit there and they, well, it, he's on the ground. If I was there, I'd just do X, Y, I would just do this. Like, nah, probably you wouldn't. Right. In fact, that's probably why you're bar stool guy and mm-hmm. he's professional mm-hmm. athlete guy. Uh, Those are different jobs. A little bit. Oh, that's true. So that's it's not true. important to me. I'm like, no, he, really, I'm not going to sit there and argue with that guy. I don't give a shit. I just don't care. Totally. It's not important. Totally. But. Really, you know, and you have to, th- I've been reading a lot of uh, Marcus Aurelius uh, over the last year, uh, former Roman emperor, and, you know, very stoic philosophy. And it basically, you know, in a little while, everything will have forgotten you. In a little while, you will have forgotten everything. Yeah. And just, you know, the whole, all the people that lived before me and all the people that lived after, yeah. you know, approval is, is great, but, uh, you know, who's really doing the approving, you know, only the people that really matter to you. You haven't met, most of us have not met the people that give us accolades or that give us, um, that are haters oh, totally. and, and trolls, you know, so it's, we're adjusting, we're adjusting to this new paradigm of social media and we'll work it out but you know it's a little rocky yeah it's it's weird right now um you can you can look on just the number of subscriptions some guys have and you look at the work and the big ones i'm seeing lately is like unbox therapy have you seen this guy 
Oh, he, uh, he, he, yeah. He just unboxes um, yeah. um, tech toys. Basically, yeah. Super, yeah. super charismatic guy. But this guy's got like three million views per thing, and like probably ten yeah. million subscribers. And people are just so fascinated by it. And uh, you know, they're nice videos. He is charismatic as hell, but he's opening stuff, and people are like, "Man, I sure do want a camera like that," and or whatever. And it's, it's, you know, it, it and. Boom. That, that, that's a great segue back into like, for example, I put so much love and, and attention into what I do. And it takes such a high level of skill to do the jujitsu, the filming, the, all of it. It's, it's, it takes a lot. And on the other hand, you know, this guy is very hip with technology and, and great. And, and it's, but you know, it's, it's okay if what I do is super niche as long as I don't lower the standard. And what we do is niche, but as long as we do it with love, I think that's the most important thing. Do it, do it well, and he's doing his thing well. Yeah. And it's a more broad-based mainstream. I mean, who doesn't love to vicariously shop, purchase, open, and explore a new toy? Yeah, it, he, he figured out a way to do something where... It's a pretty repeatable process, I'd say. It's usually the oh, same. Oh, there's new things coming out all the time. It's the same desk. Like, we have our lighting, our cameras this way. Uh-huh. But, you know, we're on the road. Yeah, he does an overhead shot. and Yeah, and he's, he's a charismatic guy, and he's able to do it. There's a lot of, um, there's one called Comics Explained or Comic Story now, and they yeah. basically recap comic book stories for you. These guys are getting millions and millions of views, and God knows how, they are, they're over a million subscribers now, and they basically just uh, recap the big comic book stories and talk about the movies coming out. Yeah. And yeah, they're, they're, they're just nailing it, but it's, again, very broad. Um, I feel like the barrier to entry uh, doing a legitimate show where you're trying to you know break the ice between the mainstream and the jujitsu world the overhead substantial because okay there's production mm -hmm. and we i you clearly have your production skills and i'm kind of working my videos up to some mm -hmm. <laughs> presentable standard my audio is good damn it um yeah but but it's not like my my background is i don't have to just read some comic books or a lot of comic right. books or whatever i have to pretty much eat you know, you know, the cold porridge for the better part of a decade and just get the crap kicked out of me for the first all years. And just to, 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 to become knowledgeable to the point of where it's actually uh, something that you'd want to put out there and you, that you can be proud of because you know, a white belt can do a podcast. There's probably plenty of them mm -hmm. and they, they're probably funny and they probably have some insight, but the insight that you gain in spending years and years and years and years working all your way up to be not just a black belt you're a third degree black belt like, uh -huh. that's a lot of damn work that goes into it yeah like it's people don't realize it's not you don't just go to karate class after school for an hour like that's that was your, your entire life is jujitsu for the, the your adult life is jujitsu that is correct but you know i'm i'm okay with that i've i've had to wrestle with this like wow look at all these mainstream things well you know i mean there's a couple ways i i think about number one the skills that i have can easily transport into a more mainstream so every every skill i gain every story i tell i'm getting better and better at um something that could cross over to mainstream oh, totally. and i'm still staying true to my roots and you know once you quote unquote um you know there, there's something cool about being niche and there's something cool about having niche fame and respect uh which is much better than being really famous really famous is a pain it's a pain in the ass yeah. uh but to be respected within your field um is very satisfying i'm seeing that more I, I, I there's can... nothing wrong with with being small and being elite and being authentic and just, and not, you know, overstretching yourself to be something that you're not. Yeah. The, the, the life that you see, you know, portrayed, um, that's basically the celebrity in, in Western culture is the new God. 
they are the new gods. Sure. But with that uh, <laughs> comes lots of sacrilege towards those new gods. And they're under the microscope. They're waiting to be eaten alive. You're waiting for every mistake. People talk about Kanye West uh, more than they talk about the, the majority of the presidents we've ever had ever. The only exception being the current one who is a celebrity himself. Right. He was beforehand. Right. A very, very successful celebrity, mind you. Mm -hmm. uh, he And he's pivoted. He's pivoted his entire career and stayed in that public eye and stayed relevant in that public eye. Yeah. He was even a pro wrestler when pro wrestling was famous. Yeah. He was a reality star and reality star reality TV was the TV to watch. He he's pivoted and all of a sudden when Obama's the biggest thing people are talking about, he figured out a way to get to be the number one guy on that TV show. So when it was CNN and Fox News, he he became the reality star of reality stars. He's the damn president. Yes. So that he's pivoted. But do I want the ridicule he gets? No. Do I want my life in the public eye? No. Yeah. But do these I are things that young people need to really consider. It's, yeah, it's because they think they want it, but you may not really want it. They want the pay and they want to feel good, right? Like have, getting it, especially if you're, if you, if you come from a, a, a big family or a family of busy parents where you don't get a lot of attention. Yeah. The idea of having all of this, uh, these accolades and, uh, all of, all of this attention paid to you must be really, really, uh, alluring, right? It must be something really desirable until you get it. Until you get it. Like, I have over 10, what is it, like 12,000 Instagram followers. I got some weird shit in my inbox. Mm -hmm. And I'm not too happy about it. Like, yeah. I love the followers. Like, it's cool. They click like and they comment stuff. And then, oh, sh they send me free stuff. It's cool. Yeah. Until you get creepy stuff in your inbox. And it's not that cool. Like, you know, the message request part. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not very happy about that part. Yeah, there are some. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And there's, there's, there's a downside. And, you, you know, don't pursue something and have the reality of what you pursued ruin the gift of this life and, and authentic friendships. I, I figure if I learned anything that I do something I love doing and uh, I'm passionate about it, it makes me happy. Cool. Done. There we go. I'm good. I, I'm literally making friends and learning. That's my job now. That's my gig. And aside from that the rest of it'll grow like you're I'll, living the dream bro you're living the dream it's, it's working out it's working out um yes the tech industry pays better yeah for for sure now now but that's that's determinism right i mean you can go out and earn a living you can build a career you can do whatever you do you get you to find your niche right yeah and then hustle um but 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 the 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 intangibles the sort of the things that have to be there the constants have to be the passion and the work ethic because without that passion do something else do anything else find the passion and if you don't have it it's cool you don't have to be compelled to force it just do whatever you want to do yeah but this is something i basically uh traded the rest of my adult life for so and i i could have went to school for anything i could have went back to school and been a phd and uh you know like i've been a neurosurgeon no right but yeah. i picked jujitsu this is deliberate i did this on purpose and it's uh i'm not sorry i enjoy it Jeff, i'm not sorry either i yeah. think i think we both chose paths that are authentic that give back and reward us immeasurably yeah and um yeah, I think it's good. You're doing good work, and and I, I hope you continue. Oh, for sure, I'm going to continue. I, what I always figured is I wanted to leverage my tech. We talked about this yesterday, I, but I want to leverage my tech background to arrive at you know, a technically presentable piece of work in terms of audio, video. I'm, I'm getting there, mm -hmm. but even the, even the voice, the content, all that stuff. Um, I, I, I I'm a jujitsu practitioner, so for me, it's going to be uh, I'm try I'm going to try. And I'm going to try to, to reflect on what I did and what, what I can improve upon. Like, wh where did I go wrong? What did I do right? Yeah. And double down on the stuff where I went right and try not to make those same mistakes again. Uh, the, my vocal patterns, breathing, saying like and uh and all these things. Th that's how people talk nowadays. Absolutely. And not doing that and pausing rather than saying uh for the, you know, when we're going to edit audio. That's a tip. If I say uh. My, my, my pattern, my vocal pattern, just it's one long wave. But mm. if I pause between thoughts, you can edit that pause. Right? Absolutely. So these are just small things I learned along the way that I never would have known if I had not picked up one of these horns and started yakking on it. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Um, I think we had, what else did we, we talked yesterday. We were, we were going to cover one more thing, but kind of, um, 
uh, everybody's beating this to death. And I, I guess I wanted to catch your thoughts on it real quick. I, sure. The jujitsu, uh, it seems like every big outfit is really trying to be the next big sporting event on TV, right? Uh huh. Uh, you know, EBI is out there, and it's, that's a hell of a product. It's entertaining. Uh, Eddie produces those things uh, out, out of LA, and they're, they've even gone down to Mexico for some of those shows. Um, Seth over at Fight to Win Pro. They produce an amazing show that it's, it's really compelling to watch. You go there live and it's the production values spot on, right? The mm -hmm. flow grappling. Do you see any of these breaking through to the mainstream? And if so, kind of which one? Just something on HBO, Showtime, on, on, on TV that could be consumed, maybe episodic or uh, even a pay-per-view type thing. Do you think this could break through to the mainstream? It's possible. Uh, they have judo on television in Japan. Sure. And they have judo on television in a lot of different countries. So it's not that dissimilar. I do think that we could have jiu-jitsu come through into the mainstream. And in some ways it has, thanks to MMA. So it could be on par with soccer and baseball uh, and football. But when it comes right down to it, we're not there yet. And we should be thankful that we're not there yet because once it does go mainstream, then there's, there are more problems, more money, more problems. I think we should just appreciate the growth that it has and um, keep it close to the chest, you know, invite more people into the club and share the art um, without the benefit of mainstream media. And I think we're doing just fine. I'd agree. I can say between when I got into jujitsu and now the barrier, to, the barriers to entry are much, much lower, greatly reduced or removed altogether with the number of academies that are out there. It was hard to get into jujitsu. Essentially, when you would go to a gym back in the day, you would be just fodder. You'd get the crap kicked out of you. And if you stayed, you'd be fodder that knew how to defend arm bars a little bit with weird ears. Yeah. And eventually, uh, you know, through just a war of attrition, you would be accepted as a member of that society because you have been beaten by people that are so technical. Eventually you learn to not die mm -hmm. and then you become one of those people, mm -hmm. but the majority of people would leave. That's why there was no women in jujitsu back then. For sure. And you, you know, people would quit. Uh, what was it like? 1% of people get their black belt. I think it's less. Probably. I'm sure it's less. Of all that start? Yes. Far less. It has to be less. I've, I've heard something like 1% or 5%, mm -hmm. and I just don't believe those are true things. Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. Okay. Let, let me just silence that, oh, no and worries. then put on the AC. I'm dying here. I, I did it to quiet it down. I did it to quiet it down. Oh, and then maybe we'll wrap it up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we're at the two-hour mark. We could actually just cut in and... Oh my God. I definitely do. I actually, that's so funny. I actually just got a thing from Unbox Therapy that he, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he just released a new video on Unbox Therapy. That's funny. All right. Well, man, it's, it's been a good hour and 45 minutes now. Um, man, I really appreciate the hospitality. Um, I've got a, head on back up down the road. Um, is there any, uh, any stuff you want to, any shout outs, any events coming up you want to do uh, to plug? Uh, I am heading in two weeks. I'm heading to Los Angeles to do uh, a very special seminar, bulletproofing pins, uh, a way of giving back to the Aikido community by, by essentially giving him more technical options. And after that, I'll be up in Alaska for a few weeks, uh, teaching at a friend's school. Um, when I come back, um, I'll be doing uh, a hop keto summer camp up in Washington state. I'm one of the guest instructors, uh, and then I head to Europe. So if you happen to be in Frankfurt, uh, Venice or Christensen, Norway, um, I hope you can join me on the mat. Awesome. And your website is always is roydean.tv. Roydean.tv. Correct. Awesome. So if, if you're, uh, depending on, regardless of what belt level you are, there's going to be some content on there that is going to be not just helpful, but very articulate, uh, compared to not just compared to other jujitsu instructionals, but just 
compared to content that's out there, uh, the production quality and the uh, the content itself is is, is super high level. So uh, if you're a white belt that's wondering what the hell do I have to do to get that stripe or get that next belt, um, this isn't going to be a one to one year instructor. But I promise, uh, if you can nail down the techniques that are covered in some of these videos, you're going to be in really good shape. I mean, not just the belt, but as a martial artist, it's uh, it's really good stuff. It helped me uh, early on. I, I've I've been watching your videos for years, so uh, definitely check them out. Roy Dean uh, TV. Thank you for, you know, the hospitality this is amazing. Uh, it's, it's nice and warm down here. Yeah. Um, uh, not looking forward to the, to the road trip back, but uh, hope everybody has a, this is going to be released a few days. And hope everybody had a great 4th of July, a great Independence Day, and a great Canada Day. So uh, thanks, Roy. Hey, my pleasure. My pleasure. And I hope you come back again. Oh, absolutely. You got to do some training when I'm, you know. <laughs> Next time <laughs> yeah. out. Less lazy. Less lazy. A little bit better time. Uh, all right. Thank you.